This is Jessica Jones on Defenders TV Podcast. We're talking episode two, a.k.a. Crush Syndrome. Welcome back, Defenders. This is Defenders TV Podcast, episode 32. We're talking about a.k.a. Crush Syndrome, the second episode of Jessica Jones. I'm Derek, one of your hosts. Hi, I'm John, one of your other hosts. Howdy, I'm Chris, the third and final host. Yeah, welcome back, guys. We're into, uh, into our second episode of our run through Jessica Jones. Uh, just want to start out by saying thanks to uh, Mississippi McDonald for our new theme tune. Hope you guys are enjoying it. Uh, that's our new theme tune for our Jessica Jones podcast. Uh, yeah, really good of him to Yeah, to do thank that. you so much, uh, Oliver, for, for doing that work. It's really appreciated. If anyone wants to uh, check out Mississippi McDonald, if anyone loves the blues then check it, his website out. The address is in the notes to uh, our podcast on our website. So it's mississippimcdonald.com. Just check that out if you are a fan of the blues. Yeah. And um, we also want to say thanks to Flickering Myth Podcast Network, which we've, uh, which are now sharing our episodes. So you should be getting your episodes over there. Guys, what did you think of episode two of Jessica Jones? I loved it. I thought it was a really... Really good development and progression on from episode one. Um, and a few things that I certainly wasn't expecting. And in particular, like, wow. I mean, abs central, <laughs> um, you know, angle grinder central. You know, there's not many men that can do that. <laughs> not even Marky right. Mark in his heyday. <laughs> Chris. Uh, I, again, I, I'm actually now. I'm still loving the show as a series to date. Um, it's I, I'm, I'm questioning myself: is it going slowly, or is it just me? Um, I, I think in Daredevil we had a bit more wham bam, mm-hmm. whereas this is a private detective show. In that, I don't think there's going to be fights every episode. I think that's just something I need to maybe temper myself with, mm-hmm. but. As a whole, I'm loving it. Yeah, yeah, really, really good so far. So if you want to follow along with all of our coverage, just make sure you subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. You can get to it easily by going to defenderstvpodcast.com slash iTunes, or you can subscribe in any other good podcast catcher for Android through Beyond Pod, Podcast Addicts, uh, Player FM, uh, or you can get us on Stitcher. And if you want to send us any feedback, just send it to feedback at defenderstvpodcast.com. We got a little bit of feedback already on the first episode of uh, Jessica Jones and our first podcast. So um, we'll, feed, we'll read that feedback out at the end of the episode. Uh, if this is your first time joining us, the way we cover our episodes is we discuss our five points that stood out to us about the episode. Uh, hopefully through that, even though there may be a little bit of crossover, we'll cover all the pieces of the episode that we feel are important or stood out to us. And then at the end, we decide whether we defend the episode or not. AKA Crush Syndrome, the second episode, was directed by S.J. Clarkson and written by Mika Schraft. Uh, John, do you want to give us the synopsis for this episode? Yes. Jessica Jones resolves to prove Hope innocent of her parents' brutal murder as she tries to enlist a sceptical Jerry Hogarth to be Hope's legal counsel. Jessica also begins to explore her own troubled past to find answers to help Hope. At the same time, her one-night stand with local barman Luke Cage starts to get complicated, as he is told he was just another case for alias investigations, and both of them begin to suspect that each other is not what they outwardly appear to be. As Jessica delves deeper into the suspected death of her former adversary, it becomes apparent that his death is but a lie. Other unexpected leads in the case give rise to a possible weakness in Kilgrave's special abilities. Now it becomes a level playing field. Good stuff. Thanks, John. Chris, do you want to kick us off with your first point? Um, yeah. Okay, so we we're, we're now two episodes in, just under two hours of kind of Jessica Jones-themed content. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm starting to see some of the patterns, if you want to call it, within the, the writing. Um like the, there's six main storyliner threads that we're going to be crossing over and kind of coming in. The and they seem to be kind of referring back to them enough now that I think they're going to be kind of key ones. Um, the first is we're going to have Jessica's relationship with Trish. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's her best friend. They got bruises together. Um, there's obviously a bit more into their kind of backstory that we'll start learning. I'm assuming. 
Um, we have the on again, off again, will they, won't they with Luke. Uh-huh. Um, we have Hope's whole story uh, in terms of her being accused. We have Mr. Kilgrave, mm-hmm. the lovely David Tennant. Yes. Um, how, how could we not love that? Um, <laughs> yeah, well, he, told, he tells us to. Mm, that's true. <laughs> we love you, David. Mm. Uh, and then we have the twins, which are the, the, the comedic element. So we have the twin, the fraternal twins uh-huh. upstairs. Obviously, we have her junkie uh, housemate or building mate or what would you call them? Neighbor. That's yeah, the word. The right, yeah. <laughs> um, Malcolm, yeah. And then you have the affair between uh, Jerry and um, her secretary. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so the, the the downfall of that relationship. Mm-hmm. So key to central, which is key to the central plot, which will be kind of Jessica going after Kilgrave. We've got five other kind of meaty storylines going on in the corner. Absolutely. Um, I think these kind of other ones are going to be key because it's interesting to see how Jess is going to interact with these plot lines. Absolutely. Because is she going to be the best friend that Trish wants her to be? Is she going to get herself involved with the the fall of Jerry's marriage? Uh, we have, obviously, Hope. Uh, is Hope a new Jessica mm-hmm. in terms of, we know, that happened? Luke, um, I'm just hoping that that gets further and further. It's going to be funny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then the Kilgrave bit. Um, I, yeah. But I think the, the one I'm most interested in is Trish. Yeah. Um, in yeah. terms of we've seen her fighting now. We've seen her bruises. Mm-hmm. Um, what else is going on? Like, will, I think, will she become Hellcat in this? Oh, will she become a temporary ally for the defenders in the, the mini movie that we're going to expect to see? Will she even turn up an Iron Fist? Mm. This, there's a lot there, but that's it, just some of my, and obviously the comedic element with the twins was brilliant in this episode. Absolutely. I don't know how to follow that <laughs> with, 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 with six points in one. Um, this is the case. This is like <laughs> awesome. This is has never happened before. Even I only do when asked for one thing, maybe three. <laughs> yeah. um, but I mean, on on those those points on on the story arcs that are, are sort of there, I definitely am interested in Trisha Walker, um, and I didn't expect to be. But uh, this episode with the whole. Um, practicing taking a gun out of someone's hand with a trainer mm. and the, the fact of that going on and with the bruises that really intrigued me and obviously that she could become Hellcat so I'm really intrigued by that I love the comic relief that that whole confrontation and mm. um, just because you had had in um, Jessica's apartment you know you've heard the noise she's chucked her shoe up at the ceiling you know it sounds like who are the people upstairs and we finally get to meet them and it's just like okay it's you two wow okay and it's just the whole interaction is really good and yeah that looks like it could just become a nice little development on on the side um and then i'm really interested in in jerry um and what she is going to do here um you know Will she introduce elements of the Iron Fist? Will she have some kind of massive downfall from this Mm -hmm. real plush uh, partnership, this legal partnership that she has? So I'm really intrigued. But I think um, my first point is I want to see more of Luke Cage's abs. I mean, like (laughs) at the end of the day, that's the storyline I want to follow is, um, you know, I have to say I loved it. Where he got that angle grinder from, I do not know. Does he carry it in his back pocket? Um, does Jessica have it in a sideboard somewhere? I don't care. The fact that he can angle grind his abs, washboard abs, chiseled abs, that to me was both funny, really funny. I did laugh, um, but I just loved it. I loved how it was played out, because even though it, it could have really descended into just a bit of, like, crazy funny that didn't suit the tone of the show, but it felt right, even yeah. though it was a bit silly. I absolutely loved it, because it showed his unbreakable skin, yeah. and that is something that I wasn't expecting to see at all and um, in 
this episode. Yeah, we questioned um, last episode whether he was already powered or not, and we thought we thought he might not be. We thought he he might be, might not be the the, the relationship there. Yeah. Definitely, like when when we saw the first episode in in New York, I had no conception that he was already uh, Luke Cage, the man with the unbreakable skin. That to me was something that probably would get found out um, in his own series, mm. Luke Cage. But obviously. There's the bar fight where you get the the hint of that, but then you know he proves it. He he shows to Jessica that he is the same as her. He is a superhero in terms of with special abilities, gifts, and and all that kind yeah. of aspect. I have to say, I put it on Christian Ritter. I think she sells the scene very well because she looks terrified when he takes the angle grinder to his body. Uh, it looks like that's it's almost like a chainsaw that he's taken to his body in her eyes. She looks completely freaked out, like there's something from a horror movie that's happening right in front of her. Uh, and I think she really sells the scene. Definitely. I mean, I've started on the 30-day shred for like the lead up <laughs> to Christmas. Um, and quite frankly... <laughs> Um, if I were to get those abs, I'd be like, oh, hooray, hooray. I don't <laughs> oh, think it's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, An angle-grinded based the six-pack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's either that or it's an apron with abs. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. That, that is how I'm going to look anything like Luke Cage. But it was a phenomenal scene. Yeah. I thought it was brilliant. Absolutely loved it. And, and we do get the appearance of the Marvel abs again. He must train in the same place that Charlie Cox does to get those get those. Marvel I think they're abs. more Chris Pratt. <laughs> they, they, they're yeah. probably a bit more defined, more Chris Pratty than the kind of Charlie Cox. Possibly. Possibly. I, I did want to inject at the beginning, kind of just when we're talking about this, is we last episode kind of said this is very much a feminine led kind of show. Mm -hmm. Um this scene kind of proves it to me. Right. Like it, it was, it was fine. It was just very, that was one for the ladies. Absolutely. Yeah, it was a hundred percent. I'm like, um, I can see it. I kind of wish I had it, but I'm like, eh. <laughs> Not just for the ladies. Okay, sorry. I do hasten to add. <laughs> but I mean, it was just like, I'm, mean, I'm wondering what is he going to come out with next? You know, angle grinder, you know, will he get a sort of a drill and start <laughs> to go in a sander? Di I, diamond cut. Yeah, exactly. How like, does he get the hair off his head? <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe. But it's, a it's, really it's... good scene. I mean, it was injected with fun. I mean, it was, yeah, potentially scary at, at the time where what's he going to do? Is he going to kill me? Yeah. Because they've kind of split up as well prior to that. So they're, they're not on the best of terms mm. because she, she's been investigating uh, him. Again, another case that's just about... Um, an extramarital affair and so on. So, you know, we'd kind of thought there was something going on, why she would be up on the fire escape in the first episode taking pictures of him. But it was just good fun. It kind of has re-injected that kind of um, sort of bond between the two of them because he's showing that, look, I'm like you. I've got, I'm, there's something different gifted about me. Yeah. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, and kind of connected to that is my first point, which is about the bar fight. Uh, I think this was fantastic. I really, really enjoyed it because we get to see a super-powered Luke Cage and a super-powered Jessica Jones going up against a group of rugby lads, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, that was really what, good. What, what a group of eight rugby lads are doing in the middle of Hell's Kitchen. Yeah. I'm a bit... Uh... I, I did think it was a weird choice to have to have some people that were playing rugby uh, in New York. You'd assume it'd be American football, wouldn't it? Uh, but it's a rugby team that are the, uh, the guys are going to attack. And it's rugby league them. as well. Yeah. yeah it's yeah. not rugby union. <laughs> The interesting, interesting distinction. Yes, there, apparently, although I have no idea why. <laughs> you know, rugby league is the best rugby. Right. I okay. See. Yeah. Answers on a postcard. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag John was wrong. <laughs> you know, but yeah, this is fantastic to actually see Luke go up against some pretty big looking guys. You know, as Jessica's looking in through the window, she sees six or seven guys staring him down and jumping on his back, essentially, and he just throws them off. Uh, we get him cracked over the head with a, with a with a bottle, essentially, and stabbed in the skin, and the bottle doesn't pierce, which is the first yeah. realisation that he has got the unbreakable skin. It's fantastic. And I love the fact that he doesn't even turn around when people are hitting him. He doesn't even make any reaction sometimes when he's getting hit by some of these guys. That was something I absolutely love from it. His expression is one of, look, lads, just... 
just don't don't mm-hmm. even try and then he's kind of like flicking people into the bar he's kind of rolling his eyes i mean you you kind of want him to just prop up against the bar maybe do a yawn <laughs> as he's like flicking yeah. these these rugby guys uh, away um and it's really good. Plus, then he's got one eye on Jessica, seeing what she's doing. Exactly. And it's just, it's a really great scene. And yeah, like connected him with the abs, it is just that, okay, he does have the unbreakable skin. Excellent. I just wasn't expecting that. For me, that was just sheer delight seeing yeah. uh, his unbreakable skin. Absolutely. And as well, seeing Jessica, I mean, her, her fighting ability as well. So she's not just not just strong and powerful. She can also throw people around pretty pretty one handedly. One handedly. That that's fantastic. Another great shot where she picks up a guy and throws him over the bar like he's nothing. Uh, brilliant. Although she so. did super power kick a guy between the legs. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, that kind of made me go Ooh. Ooh, okay. Right. <laughs> you were super strong and that that's kind of that guy got up though. I'm like, what, what, how? Yeah. Is she pulling her kicks? She must be. She must be. I yeah. think that now that was the bit when you saw you saw Luke getting kind of smashed over the head he was looking and he didn't care it yeah. was just like Ugh, yawn yeah. as you said and i'm like there was this kind of like meh move over there you go over there and just yeah. go away she even kind of had this slight okay now stop yeah. and i think that was the fun point when we see them unleash mm-hmm. that's going to be interesting yeah yeah and i think because they, they are they looks like they're holding back so i i'm dying to see them go up against like a Reckoner or the Devastation Crew or someone, a Hell's Kitchen type, the the Wrecking Crew, for example, right. the guys with the crowbar and uh, the ski masks and stuff, because that's going to be interesting mm-hmm. because they're super strong and almost unbreakable. And then it becomes a proper kind of fisticuffs match where knock people down, are knock down. Draw, yeah. yeah. Like, basically, what I want is a superhero-powered hallway corridor scene mm-hmm. from Daredevil. Can you imagine that? Not only just people flying through the door, it's they're flying through the wall. <laughs> <laughs> that would be that would be great. But I did like this bar fight scene. I didn't expect to have, given the first episode and the pace of it. I didn't really expect a big fight scene to come in the second episode. Um, they did it with Daredevil. That's how they closed out. The second episode of Daredevil was the big fight scene, essentially, and that's the center of it. The show feels different. It doesn't feel like it's going to have that many huge fight sequences in it. It feels much more cerebral. Uh, so just to have this this scene to show off the powers of the two characters, that was great. No, absolutely. And I think like Chris made a really good point when we were watching it about how... Um, Jessica seemed to be damaging the bar more than than Luke did. Yeah. And the fact that you had in the first episode this idea that she deduces from speaking with Luke that, you know, if someone did start to break up the bar, then you'd get mad and you would probably throw them out or punch them or something. So it was really interesting to kind of see that happen. Mm. Um, And again, it was also just the context was about their relationship. You know, she's the... She's she's coming to help him because uh, she's just had a visit from Gina, the the woman who he's been seeing and he doesn't know is married. She's told him that her husband's about to to head down, and she's trying to make up for the fact that you know he was pretty annoyed at her for being just a case. Yeah. So I really like that kind of context to the bar fight as well. I thought that was really really. Sweet. Absolutely. And it closes out again with some free booze. Um, free shots for all, as Luke says. So uh, <laughs> he likes giving out the free booze, doesn't he? Absolutely. I want to drink in Luke's. Absolutely. Uh, Chris, do you want to give us your second point? It kind of continues on. It just actually, yeah, Luke as a whole, um, I was very, very, very happy to see him powered. Um, mm-hmm. But we did see a... Previously, we, we had asked with that photo within the... Um, in the cupboard mm-hmm. with Jessica. Who was that? Is it a sister? Is it, we, we still don't know. But then we see in the hospital a, a name, which I'm pretty sure was the same girl from the bus crash. Yeah. And that turns out to be Reva Connors with the name on it. So, um, some of our eagle eyed kind of internet accessed listeners can do a quick search on that within in 1972 in the first uh, Luke Cage hero for hire number one mm-hmm. Reaver Connors is um, Luke Cage's partner right not superhero partner I mean relationship romantic partner right, right. Uh, I don't think they're married or anything so that d- leaves me now more speculation okay we've got a girlfriend a dead girlfriend a dead wife a dead something right. situation kind of coming on here but 
they're being truthful. The truthful kind of to the core stories. Mm. It looks like we're going to get the, the alias, um, kind of storylines from Jessica Jones by Brandis. They're not going for a more soft core version. Mm-hmm. We think we're going to get that. And I think I'm pretty sure now. And then it's also they're being truthful to Luke Cage's kind of origin stories. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so how, so. He, okay, hopefully we won't get the afro with the bracelet across <laughs> or the, the headband. Although that could be, imagine we get this amazing Halloween photo in his house somewhere <laughs> of him great. dressed up in the yellow with the headband with a big fro. Mm-hmm. Be amazing. I wouldn't like to be the guy that that asks him even to try on that costume. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't I don't know whether I don't know whether Mike Coulter would be up for that. <laughs> I just I want I just I don't want to be the guy who goes. Is that a tiara you're wearing? Yeah, 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 definitely. <laughs> that's just looking for fights, really, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, and that's where I'm like going. Ah. Uh, no, yeah. So it's just that was very interesting for me. Um, I'm I'm glad that they're staying so honest to these characters, and again with uh, Trish. Mm-hmm. They they're staying truthful to Hellcat. Mm-hmm. So she's training. She either was or will be. Hellcat. So, unlike Daredevil, where they took Night Nurse and changed her and molded two characters together, yeah. this is okay. No, we've learned our lessons. We're not gonna we're not gonna mess with some of you guys and your stories. Yeah, and they've recently said just a, a slight side point that it recently say that Night Nurse, uh, we thought was Night Nurse in uh, Daredevil, is not Night Nurse because that character is going to appear in Doctor Strange. So that was oh, Night Nurse. Oh, so who, who so who's yeah. Claire going to be? So Claire is just Claire Temple. Oh, there you go. So we'll find out more as she might appear in Jessica Jones. She Ooh. might indeed. Mm. I was expecting to see her in the hospital. Definitely. Because we yeah. think it is the same hospital, Hell's Kitchen Hospital. Or? Yeah, you'd assume, you'd assume. That's, uh, yeah, that's pretty close to the Hell's Kitchen area, the hospital that they're talking about. So we assumed, oh, I definitely assumed we see her in there. We didn't see her, did we? No. no. Well, the, 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 there was an African American lady, but we, you couldn't kind of tell. Right. It was just the back of the head. And I'm like, going, no, they'd be a bit more. Here she is. Yeah, Boom. Absolutely. <laughs> they wouldn't, they definitely wouldn't get her on board just to uh, walk past in the background with the no, definitely well, focus in on her. <laughs> no, like, again, they don't want you, like, we all love Easter eggs. So mm-hmm. yeah, you, I'm expecting to see another Stan Lee kind of Easter egg cameo, mm-hmm. like picture on the wall type thing. Hopefully. Here's Uncle Stan. Yeah. Mm. Hopefully. That's true, actually. We've got to keep our eyes peeled for the Stan. For the Stan. Mm-hmm. Stan the man. Definitely. So John, did you see Stan in this episode or do you have another point? I didn't see Stan in in this episode. Uh, My next point is we get to see Kilgrave and he's knocking on the door of apartment 128B Mm -hmm. and the poor family that are located within it. Um, This is like our first real big sort of look at Kilgrave. And there's still not that much. It's very, you know, from... You know, pan shots from behind the head and and all that. Yeah. But, again, this is a really nice scene. You have his uh, mind control powers uh, on show here. You have his essential disdain for their children. Mm -hmm. They're telling them to get into the closet. I'm kind of thinking, how long are they going to be in there? Um, You just see him taking over that family apartment. Yeah. Sitting down to enjoy their meal um, kind of cleaning a knife, a pretty brutal looking knife. Whether these people are going to survive is something to, um, to, to speculate on. Yeah. But, you know, this was a really good little introduction just to, just to see him. It was great to see him there. Um, you know, we have that, that purple aspect again on the subway, uh, with Jessica Jones where he's bleeding into our thoughts, really good. But it's great to see him then in the flesh, in person, doing his thing uh, in kind of real time, yeah. I suppose. Yeah, it's the first time we've seen him in real time. I think I mentioned last episode, everything that we saw of him was all in flashback. It was all people describing what his powers were like or giving uh, elements of what he'd done in the past. This is a really creepy scene where he goes in, he sits down for dinner, as you say, asks them what it is. And then is told that the the lamb, the speciality of the husband in the house. And he says, well, I'll make up my own mind. I have very particular tastes while he's stroking that knife. Really creepy scene. Yeah, and I'm uh, really concerned for that family. Definitely. Yeah, and I think Kilgrave, the, the, the bit I was quite interested in is they're referring to Kilgrave as a cockroach. Mm. So, Jessica, we see the cockroach in the sink and it scurries into the sink at That's the beginning right. of the episode. Yeah. 
where and so obviously getting into the pipes, the inner workings down into the mind. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the episode, when she's kind of embattling herself to, oh, I can fight him, he, the cockroach comes up and she squishes it. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, that's a nice metaphor. Yeah. That was quite clever. Yeah, that's really well, really well done, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, and the kidneys? How badly damaged is he going to be? Or how badly? We know so now the kidneys are, his kidneys were shot. Mm-hmm. Um, but crushed. Crushed. Crushed, crushed syndrome. Oh. Yes. Crushed syndrome kidneys. Or crushed kidney syndrome. There you go. Um, but yeah, no, so that bus kind of, and that was a bit of like, oh, I wasn't expecting that. Yeah. I was expecting, okay, that's how he died. Uh, that's, you'd expect a bit more. So I'm wondering, is there an element where we'll see a bit more scar, scarification, um, something? Mm. Will they mar the beautiful David Tennant's face so that he's not recognizable? Well, isn't it interesting that he convinced someone to replace the kidneys for him? And that's, that's the whole thing. He wouldn't, he wouldn't accept the fact that he would be able to live with the one kidney he had. He wanted to get both of them replaced for perfectly brand new kidneys. So he's obviously quite a, uh, quite a sensitive person. Knowing that he can tell anybody to do whatever he wants them to do is a, uh, very important to his character. Yeah, no, I, I like, I actually really liked that scene with the bus, um, because the, the way it was, maybe it was just the way the CGI was done, but it, it looked like in trying to get out of the way of it, he has tried to control the mind of the driver to, yeah. to avoid him. But then in doing so, it tipped the bus over and then he got knocked, um, and chucked out of, out of frame of the camera. But I really liked that, that, that scene. And, and you also then see the fact that Jessica is, in some way, able to resist his control. Yeah. Um, presumably down to her own superpowers, maybe. Yeah, or- it, I, I wrote down exactly the same point, but it looked to me as if Jessica was not only just resisting, it looked like she was walking in front of the bus to kill herself. It looked like she was going to commit suicide, and that's why he was calling her back, essentially, and then he made the bus flip, knocking him over. That's that's the way I took the scene. Yeah, really interesting, really uh, really looking forward to seeing a bit more of uh, of Kilgrave, but a great scene, definitely. Derek, uh, what's your next point? Uh, my next point is just part of the subway scene, uh, which I just thought was a really well filmed scene and really well put together uh, piece where Jessica's sitting on her own on one side of the subway looking around at all the couples and all the people around her. It's just such a well put together scene because it shows you how distant she feels to the rest of the people. In a city like New York, which is cramped enough with millions of people around her, you can really feel the isolation of this character. She's sitting on her own watching. Um, there's a couple on, on one end, there's an... Uh, some old friends clearly who are sitting beside each other talking the whole time to each other I really like the scene and, and the placement of it and during that scene essentially in comes Kilgrave to give her another wake up call and she smashes the window of the sub- subway distancing herself further from all the people around her who wouldn't have even noticed her if it wasn't for this Kilgrave hanging over her head No absolutely again it's it's just a really great scene where it goes purple like all of a sudden out of out of the blue pardon the color change there <laughs> um you know it really does just i love it because it, it's just so unexpected like um part of me was thinking is she going to see him here mm. or something but it is just literally this kind of this this memory lapse like it's almost like she loses concentration and that's when he comes in yeah. and it's kind of unexpected all the time and i, I just think that's really a uh, really cool way of doing it. And of course, everyone then looking at her going, why has she just done that? And you know, there's the big smashed kind of cracked window of, of the, the, the metro train. Yeah. Yeah. So, and on that point, I'm starting to wonder, is this the PTSD or is he actually following her? Is mm. he, cause she said there was a, there was a distance thing. Yeah. Um, so is it he actually talking to her? Is he whispering to her in her mind? Um, cause I don't, I don't fully understand the powers just yet. It, does he have to vocalize it? Yeah. Can he project with his mind? That kind of thing. So I'm one, I'm curious now. Is Kilgrave like alive following or going around or is this kind of post traumatic stress disorder and she's just freaking out at every time her, she lets her mind wander? Yeah. It's an interesting point. Trish said it to her in the first episode, didn't she? That, uh, that, you know, is, has, is he back or are you just getting those visions again? Do you just need to go and see that psychologist again that you saw? Um, yeah, I thought that was, thought that was quite interesting, definitely. Yeah. And I think she also says to hope that, you know, 
it it will begin to fade. I think that was from the first episode. Yeah. So maybe these are just kind of like really distant, really kind of just at this stage echoey at remnants of, of what he did to her, but maybe still have a, a, a force uh, that that knocks her each time that she gets them. So yeah. yeah, no, that's really interesting actually to see. Is it just in her mind and this PTSD, mm. or is it? actually him back alive and there like he is alive and he's there but is he able to like project towards her in that way yeah is it kind of once he's made the connection at some point he's always maybe got that kind of line into um the person who he's affected yeah that that would be really interesting yeah absolutely yeah. absolutely chris do you want to give us your next point um, so there was a powerful moment, uh, of it very much in the, the se- episode one where we had the lick. Mm-hmm. And that was the kind of ugh moment. This episode had a, a poignant moment again for me and as well written was the kill me. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 Definitely. We thought, we all thought Kilgrave, he's writing Kilgrave. No, kill me. And the, the, the having that bus driver, sorry, the ambulance driver, um, in, that way and he's asking to be killed his mother's a holy roller mm-hmm. um I, 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 that has something to do with it in fact he has no kidneys in fact he has a stroke who knows that was a very interesting way to kind of take what you could consider a very high risk um tv show kind of subplot mm-hmm. and then euthanasia which most TV shows won't touch. Absolutely. Um, now, obviously, she said no and walked away, but we don't know. Maybe she'll go back later and unplug him. Right. We, is that a storyline into itself later on? Mm. Is there a reason she won't do that? That was just a very powerful moment. Yeah. And I'm kind of hoping they'll they'll do this. We'll have maybe these powerful moments. We'll have the powerful ugh uh, kind of shudder moments. We'll have these powerful heart wrenching ones. Yeah. We'll have the powerful. Love making will have powerful laughing, powerful fighting. Like I'm wondering if these each episode will have this one kind of oh my god moment. Right. And I think that for that for me that oh my god moment was the kind of kill me. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think there's a there's a lot kind of talked about around that about how uh, how his mother is treating him. Um, it's very much she is as you say very very almost addicted to her to her faith. Um, essentially saying that everything that's happened is in God's plan, saying everything that's gone wrong is because that's what God wanted, saying that he was a womanizer, he was a drinker, and he never came home. Now he's stuck in the house with her 24 hours a day, and isn't that great? Because God, because she prayed for him to be saved by God, and that's why he's there. It's a tough scene. And then to see that that's the outcome of it is that the note to Jessica to say kill him. Yeah, um, yeah really tough scene. Yeah, it's really hard um, to to deal with that. And I mean, of course, it it has a lot of other threads around it in that, you know, he's the ambulance driver that's disappeared. Mm. Um, It it explains why um, the John Doe that Jessica is looking for on the hospital records isn't there. Mm -hmm. And then also we have the whole link to the dialysis machine. And it's not just that, Kilgrave took his kidneys, but it's that he's had a stroke since and like he is simply wanting to leave. And, and I think just the pain on Kristen Ritter's face on, um, as she's kind of like saying, I'm sorry. Like she's mouthing, I'm sorry as she's leaving. Mm. And, and before that, she's like trying to speak to him because, you know, she recognizes there's a consciousness there. Um, and saying, you know, I will get him. And then you get the whole him trying to write. And she thinks, like we all did, yeah. as Kilgrave. Chris has said, it's Kilgrave. And then it becomes Kill Me. Like, tough scene. Um, you know, really good scene for that. And it has a lot of story elements as well that drives into, you know, the, um, Dr. Carada, um, who, who's the, the guy who actually did the operation and, and that whole uh, storyline as well. Which then um, involves uh, Jerry Hogarth. You know, here's another example of what Hope is trying to say. Yeah. So it, it was a really good scene. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. John, do you want to give us your next point? Yeah, I'm going to take 
slightly different tack here. Um, I suppose it's that New York is part of the, the character of this show mm. and you have that, um, for Daredevil, you, you've had that said again, uh, about Jessica Jones. And um, it's also been said, say, for, for Gotham on, uh, the podcast that we do, um, Gotham TV podcast. And the, plug, the, plug, 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 <laughs> plug, plug, plug. Um, but that all, you know, that the city is a character in it. I think as well, I just want to say, I think Jessica Jones's apartment door is also, uh, this character in it. You know, we see it in the first episode with someone being flung through it. Mm-hmm. And now in this episode, Trisha is trying to make Jessica safe and uh, she's trying to get it replaced. And there's a great scene where she again thinks that someone has broken into the apartment. Right. I was there thinking it was Malcolm again had wandered in. And instead, um, you know, and the poor guy who's been asked to come and put in the alias investigations window, replace the broken one, is flung through the air, is like essentially going to be hospitalized. And I just thought it was a really good kind of... um you know, false alarm. But again, it was all around the door. And I really thought this was interesting. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And I'm wondering as well now whether the door is going to crop up in future episodes right. because it, it really seems to be taking a life of its own. I mean, even just the fact that every time she closes, the hinges drop and, you know, it's not level. It's just, it's just a nice thing because it's kind of so iconic from, from the comics and, um, you know, we talked about it in the, the first podcast about the guy being flung through. So it'd be interesting to see, but yeah. I, that was, that was just a nice little touch for me, actually. A- absolutely. I wonder if it's, if it's kind of like the uh, Nelson and Murdoch attorneys at law sign, which was quite a big uh, talking point during the episodes of Daredevil, where, you know, it, it symbolized that they now had their own, uh, their own working practice. It symbolized the breakup of their relationship. So is this door that kind of symbol between, particularly between Trish and Jessica for this episode? Absolutely. Yeah. I still wish I had sent avocados at law. <laughs> of course. Still wish. Of course. Uh, my, my point is kind of connected with that. It was actually just about the, the scene where Trish arrives at Jessica's place. These two characters couldn't be more different, could they? No. Um, it's a fantastically put together scene because it looks like Trish has never been there before. The reaction of her to the place is, this is nice. Um, okay. But she looks like she really stands apart from, from it. She looks like she's from a completely different society almost to Jessica. So I'm interested to see what the connection between the two characters is. Um, she just seemed like she was, she just didn't belong in Jessica's, uh, down and out world in, in Hell's Kitchen. So quite interesting. Yeah. It was the fact that she, I think she says it's like, your place is cute. And, and Jessica read into that. It's a dump. I can tell by your voice. Like mm-hmm. she's, it's just, yeah, a really good little scene. Yeah. And I think it just says, you know, again, Jessica is trying to protect Trish. Stay away from me. You know, um, I'm life threatening. Yeah. It's just like, it's a, it's a really good little scene. Absolutely. Definitely. And I do like the, the fact that, uh, that essentially Trish will just throw money at it. If Jessica has a problem, Trish will go, oh, here's a couple of grand to sort out the door uh, and fix all the issues they have together as well. We all need friends like that. Oh, God. I, I I, I, I've yet to find one. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, you could, you guys can be my friend like that. Um, maybe not. Mm. But if you'd like to sponsor our podcast, you can it's send, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> you can send donations to, <laughs> um, yeah, that was, uh, that was my points no and yeah i i agree with you guys I, like i said it kind of one of my first of six points um <laughs> it it for me that that is going to be an interesting story arc mm-hmm. how are they friends why are they friends what it where is that going will they become vigilante best friends again mm-hmm. after drifting apart are they going to come to blows blah 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 like is hell powered not blah 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 mm-hmm. I, I again yeah i i, I think it I get also from a directorial kind of casting choice, they were right with these two characters. Yeah. They, they, it is uh, black versus white almost in even the look and feel of the, the, the costumes of the two of them. Yeah. One absolutely. is prim and proper. The other is not down and out, grungy, dirty kind of yeah. the girl I'd like to meet on the street at the middle of 3 a.m. in Hell's Kitchen. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I think I know, they, they, the, it, it's an interesting dichotomy between the two. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, Chris, do you want to give us your final point? Yeah, uh, for me, it was the, the scene, the interrogation scene, or interrogation, probably wrong word, with, between Jessica and Hope. Mm-hmm. 
Um, interview. It, interview. That would be a better way of putting it. Yes, uh, interview between Jessica and Hope. Um, it was quite interesting. Obviously, the the at first I thought because Hope was just staring off the distance. Oh no, she's brain damage. Something's happened. She's comatose. It's kind of this craziness. Mm-hmm. Um, then we do see that there she comes out of it and. She kind of said, kill yourself as one of the most oh, yeah. memorable parts of that conversation. Definitely. Um, but the one that stuck out for me was, uh, are you a good jumper, Jessica? Yeah. Um, he used to make me jump all the time, but I, I always came in second in the state finals or sorry, I came, always came second in the state finals. Are you better than me? Yeah. Um, again, so I was kind of going, oh, so he abused Jessica's powers while she was there. Yeah. Um, are you making her jump kind of like a tall building in a single bound? Yeah. Or two bounds? We, we, we still don't know if she can fly, but <laughs> <laughs> fingers crossed. All right. Um, but yeah, but that scene as a whole was very kind of interesting in terms of just the insight we get into hope, mm-hmm. but also these little tidbits that we get into Jessica. Absolutely. It's like as if Kilgrave has has set up Jessica as being the person at fault for Hope's situation. He's basically telling her, if Jessica hadn't run away and hadn't left me, I wouldn't be doing this to you, and you're not as good as her, is basically what he's kind of saying. Yeah, and that was one of the biggest things about that scene for me as well, was just the fact that, you know, and I kind of wasn't expecting her to say it, but just that Hope blames Jessica for the death of her parents, yeah. and that it is her fault. She talks about her brother now being all alone, and why couldn't you have made sure he was dead, and all this. Um, and she goes, um, you should kill yourself. And again, the self-loathing of, of Jessica Jones prompts her to say, probably, but then, but I'm the only one that knows you're innocent. Yeah. You know, and it kind of kicks off again. Trying to persuade um, Jerry Hogarth to to take this case, and again, really cold sort of response from Jerry Hogarth. It's like I only take cases that I win. You know, this is not a dead certainty. Oh, the loser, the yeah. loser one. Um, There's a name for these. Like losers. it's really like brutally sort of um, about self importance coming Absolutely. from Jerry Hogarth, and it, it's it's something that struck me as being very different, say, from if this is the Jerry Hogarth of Iron Fist, at least from the Immortal Iron Fist comics, that's a slightly different. Um, Jaron Hogarth, the man from the comics, it seems a much more nervous character, is is much more kind of down on his look, doesn't Mm. have that self-confidence, which, um, you know, he's good at his job, but he he doesn't express that... um, that confidence like um Carrie Ann Moss is doing um here as Jerry Hogarth. Yeah. And and particular the self importance, the self confidence, and, and in a sense the the disregard for weaker people. It's a really interesting kind of look at that character. And it all comes about from Jessica saying, you know, I need someone else now to believe what I believe and we need to get the legal I wonder if we're going to see, is this the downfall of Jerry? Maybe. So, like, she was a high-flying lawyer. Mm. Um, by the end of Jessica Jones Series 1, she's down on her luck. She doesn't trust herself. She's more she's more kind of retrospective, inflective. And then that's where it slots into the exactly. brand in the yeah. organization. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Good Good point. Um, I did also like the uh, the... Uh, the scene itself where Jessica's talking to Jerry and telling her, I'll owe you a favor if you do this for me. And you can see that she's just spitting out the words. Jessica does not want to owe any person, anybody at all, no matter how much she works with them or knows them. She doesn't want to owe anybody a favor. That was that was the most disgusting thing she had to say out of her mouth. I owe you a favor. Uh, fantastic moment. Really, really good. Um, John, do you have a final point? I do. And it is Kilgrave's weakness. Um, like with the cockroach, um, we find out that potentially, still to be confirmed, but that Kilgrave may have a weakness. We find out from um, it's Dr. Carada mm-hmm. who who did the kidney transplants that he did it purely with a, a local anaesthetic, not a surgical full anaesthetic, and um, because he was controlling him all the time to make sure that he did it and didn't kill him 
or that he wasn't left on the table to bleed out. He, Kilgrave ultimately wanted that control all the time. And I think this is what Jessica is now seized upon to say, right, this is something that I can work with to to make sure he's no longer a threat, yeah. to remove his power of control uh, against people. And I love then right at the end where she says, you know, he knew my weakness, which is sometimes I care about people that I actually give a damn. Uh, now I know yours. You know, it's kind of this I've said in the synopsis the the playing field's been leveled. Mm-hmm. Uh, she knows his. He always knew what hers was, and that's what he tapped into. And now she she's got this potential uh, weapon or or uh, means of maybe bringing him down. Yeah, definitely, because it feels like there would, there would be nothing that would take down somebody that all he has to do is speak to you, and he can control your mind. You know, cotton bud or wax in the ears. There you go. <laughs> I like See? it. I like it. Uh, just get some headphones on, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, really good. So, Derek, have you got a final point for us here? Um, I don't really, because most of the points have been taken. Oh, okay, um, good. I did want to just talk about the neighbours, uh, actually, again, because uh, I really did enjoy that scene. I thought that was a hilarious moment, but we have talked about uh, pretty much most of my points uh, throughout this discussion. But, 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 the wife runs. I know, hilarious. That was, um, I was not expecting that. Yeah. I'd pick up some pants. And he was like, what? what? That makes no... Ah! Yeah. And I certainly wasn't expecting the neighbours to be uh, to be twins. Wasn't expecting... Fraternal twins. twins. Yeah, that's, uh, that, was a bit, that was a bit crazy. Um, but these are interesting characters. And it seems like to them, Jessica is the bitch in the apartment below, essentially. So, uh, <laughs> the bitch in apartment 23. Yeah, so I want Please, to check. Oh, we need to check I want the to check the number, number of the apartment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a, a fun little moment. So yeah, with these neighbours upstairs and with Malcolm in the building, it's a really interesting building to live in. It just kind of shows you what the neighbourhood of Hell's Kitchen is like and the kind of people that live there. You know, she's clearly down her luck, got, not got much money, and has her little office in the middle of an apartment block with these kind of neighbours around her. So quite an interesting location. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things where you think if Wilson Fisk wasn't in prison, he would probably be trying to tear down <laughs> um, that apartment block yeah. to, to save his city. Very true. Really. You know, it's um, but it is the, the, the a nice little kooky element I think to this, and yeah, like the the white Y fronts um, was not expecting that. Yeah. I love how like there's this random argument going on about cordon bleu, right. and it it's was French, just, John. Yeah, <laughs> it's just like really, really like just weird, and it's like she just she grabs the woman by the the throat and just like. Lifts her up. Lifts her up and tells her, you know, shut up uh, and get a life. Yep. Uh, I love it. Really like really, it. Really, really good. Yeah. Really, really good. Uh, is that all the points we everybody has? Uh, that's everything for this one, I think. That's everything, yeah. yeah. Uh, Chris, do you defend this episode? I do. Uh, yep, yep, no, and yeah. <laughs> so that was a yes, yep, no, no, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So there was a part in between, apparently, I didn't like, but uh, no, I did, no, I very much enjoyed it. And again, I'm holding out hope that this is going to be a continued up and up trajectory for each episode. Mm-hmm. We don't get any fillers. Um based on Daredevil. We may get one or two, but um yeah no I'm holding out hope. Excellent. Excellent. Uh John, do you defend this episode? Yes, I do. I defend this episode as much as I did last time. I am gonna give it again four point five bags of dicks uh out of five. Private dicks. Uh, private dicks, of course. Um yeah, this was again another great episode. You know, it is much more of a slow burner than I think Daredevil. Mm. Um but I-, I loved the introduction of Kilgrave for real this time. For me I absolutely loved the introduction of Kilgrave in person this time, actually menacing that poor family in, in the apartment. I thought the bar fight and um, the lead up to that um, with the kind of the split, I suppose, between um, Luke Cage and Jessica was really good. The fact that we got Luke Cage and his unbreakable skin, mm-hmm. that to me was the most um, unexpected part of this, which I just absolutely enjoyed when it happened in the bar. And then when he brought the angle grinder to those abs. Right. I mean, it was just sheer wonder, really. <laughs> um, great uh, writing. I love then the two sort of poignant moments here um, with Hope at the start 
Um, and obviously with the ambulance driver, Jack Denton, mm -hmm. you know, really poignant, really quite sad, quite tough scenes uh, to do, but just how they all carried on the story from that central hub, both through um, Jerry Hogarth's sort of involvement now within Hope's case, Absolutely. and also then for Jessica tracking down um, Dr. Carrada, in order to find then this weakness mm -hmm. um, of Kilgraves that gives Jessica and, of course, ourselves as the audience hope that this guy who does seemingly have this absolutely impenetrable skill and power can have a weakness that can be used against him to take him down. Yeah. So I loved it. I thought it was really, really good. Yeah, definitely. Derek, do you defend this episode of Jessica Jones. Absolutely, yeah. For all the points you've said, I, I think the opening scene with uh, with Hope is a really tough scene to watch and it really shows you what Jessica could have become if she never got away from Kilgrave. Um, it's really interesting to show that other side. Uh, Jessica's a tough character, um, but you can see how brittle she is underneath it all and the exterior that she has and just her having that scene of her sitting in a room with Hope showing what um, what she could have become I thought was fantastic. The scene with uh, in the bar, the bar fight, Absolutely brilliant. Again, showing the parallel between her and another superpowered being or superpowered character. Um, really interesting to see those, those parallels for Jessica. And again, loads of other stuff going on in this episode, loads of stuff with the characters that are really, really enjoyed. Definitely defend this episode. Excellent. I think uh, with that, we can move on to some of the feedback that we've received. Yeah, we got a bit of feedback in from Rebecca about our discussion about Iron Fist, I think was in episode 30. Um, she, she says just a little bit of feedback about Iron Fist and guns in Immortal Iron Fist. Uh, Orson Randall is an Iron Fist that uses guns and he explains it to Danny. So I think that Danny can use guns. He just doesn't because he didn't know he could until Orson Randall explains it to him, and by that stage, he's already used those powers, essentially. So he doesn't use guns. So that's just to answer your question about whether you would see Danny Rand running around with uh, with pistols. Yeah, no, I, I thought he did. I thought there was some somewhere in my mind, I remembered there being guns involved. And I, I think it's more that, yeah, he doesn't want to use them, and he wants to use the power of the Iron Fist. But given the circumstance there is always the possibility that he could use a gun or given who is the Iron Fist at that moment in time, yeah. there could also be um, a moment where guns are a, a weapon of choice. Absolutely. And Rebecca also says that Orson Randall uh, is described as having experience focusing his chi into pistols uh, and sometimes known as gun fu. There you go. I love Kung Fu. Kung Fu is Gun awesome. Fu. I like it. And in the, that, in that actually, the series she's mentioning, there is a, a number of mini kind of flashbacks to other previous Iron Fists as well. That's right. Yeah. We had the one of the Iron Fists with a bow and arrow, um, who was raining fire. Um, but I think Danny's. I I think it's better because if, if we're going to see Danny with. Um, uh, two, two a pair of shotguns and a, a bit yeah. more Punisher esque. Uh, I think it's gonna be it'll be like yeah, just send Danny in. The rest of them could just take a break. Yeah, I yeah. want to see the Iron Fist definitely. Um, but but Gun Fu would be good. True, but then you had the whole bending bullets thing. Remember that oh, that yeah. the terrible movie with was Angelina Jolie and mm -hmm. what um, was the other was guy? Chris Evans in that as well. No, no, no. it was, was Wanted, wasn't it? With um, Wanted with, with uh, Charles um, Xavier. Yeah, yes, James McAvoy. James McAvoy, that's it. Yeah. 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 But the bending of the bullet, that, that's Kung Fu. And that's yeah. just like, it just doesn't translate. Doesn't. I suppose they could, but not on a Netflix no. budget. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Iron Fist with the Chi. Right. Iron Fist. Thanks for that feedback, Rebecca, on uh, on Iron Fist. Uh, a little bit of feedback from Ben Rush, also on uh, the first episode and on our first podcast already. Thanks very much, Ben. Um, he uh, He says, I will say, if, you, if they do that scene in... Jessica Jones between her her and Kilgrave. Uh, I hope that they don't go full girl with the dragon tattoo Swedish version on it because I think for a Marvel show that might be a step too far. Within the dragon tattoo films it works but I think the average comic book movie viewers are not ready for something that intense. So that was about your, your point Chris. Yeah, um... No, I, I agree, and I, I I know the scene in the version of the film he's talking about the, the non-Daniel uh, Craig version. Um... I think they can do it. Um, I think when we kind of had a brief discussion uh, post the show about that topic as well, we uh, 
John brought up Game of Thrones and that Sansa Stark in the latest series mm. and that one that was quite controversial. That that was on network te- television in the States, network mm-hmm. television across the world. And that got away with it because this, you've got to remember as well, the, they're trying to ground Game of Thrones, a fantasy show in reality. Yeah. And this is a superhero show, which they're trying to ground in reality. And I, I think showing that brutal aspect of that act and that scene in particular, I think they probably will do it. Yeah. They, they, they may do it. They may go the, the kind of, uh, Game of Thrones style on it. Mm-hmm. And they won't obviously show any, uh, triple X rated, um, kind of, viewer discretion advice right, scenes right. or they may go the completely other way which is a flashback mm-hmm. from her point of view in the dark silhouetted with her crying and it's just after and we just told it's happened yeah yeah i think also for example in the first episode of jessica jones you see a, a, a woman kill her parents well you think you do but you don't you see nothing of it you see uh, her taking a gun out of her bag as a um as the elevator door closes you hear two shots and the bodies are left there at the end you've actually seen nothing but everything implied shows you how affecting a scene can be without having to show exactly what's happened so um so i think that's also a possibility can you imagine david tennant closing the door full kilgrave mode Mm -hmm. with jessica on the bed closing the door yeah and then we cut to uh, purple, and then you cut to Jessica crying on the bed. Yeah, yeah. that will be as powerful to, and you'll know. Everyone will know, and based on the person, person's age, experience of the world, blah blah blah, we will infer our own levels of emotion to that Absolutely. scene. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And some of our listeners probably have seen uh, exactly what's happened in the future episodes, but obviously, again, we're not watching ahead. So, yeah, and I mean, I think. I mean, I can understand uh, the comment, definitely. Um, but I think the show is saying that it, Ryan Michael Bendis and Michael Gatos, it's it's their version of Jessica Jones, of Alias, that is sort of informing this show. I think it can be done where it's implied. It doesn't have to be anything explicit mm-hmm. or, or really full on. And I think as well that, um, you know, in the same way that... The, the the head smashed in in the door from Daredevil, you didn't see that happen, but you saw um you know Wilson Fisk repeatedly closing the door, you saw That's the it. blood on Wesley, and it's it's implied. I think as well we do have to remember that alias the comics, the graphic novels, were part of Marvel Max. Mm. So they are very graphic. Yeah. They are graphic, and that's why they were Marvel Max, and so in that sense, it wouldn't surprise me if they if this is addressed the the scene mm-hmm. uh, from the comics in in the show. But again, it's how it's done, uh, and and any scene or any show that tries to address a, a, and look at the the um, the way in which that brutal type of act is done has to obviously always be mindful about how they put it across and that it is um believable uh sensitive and and uh you know makes it um as despicable as everyone knows it to be yeah. so that's that's the thing and i mean at the end of the day you have to say that marvel will always use good judgment from everything pretty much that you've seen and um, you know that they do use that. So it will be interesting to see how or if potentially they do approach this. But I wouldn't be surprised if, if that scene, um, between Kilgrave and Jessica mm-hmm. could be in it in some form or another. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, just to kind of close, it's, I think this, what the scene will be in it. I think everything we've seen from Daredevil and everything we've seen in these first two episodes of Jessica Jones leads me to believe they'll do it tastefully. Mm -hmm. They'll do it in a way that's still quite emotional, quite poignant, brings across the, 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 uh, the reasoning and the, the, the experience that needs to go across with that type of terrible scene, but it will not be in a way that causes outrage per se. Um, I think, what we've seen from Melissa in her writing style in the first two episodes and uh, as kind of showrunner, 
And then what we've seen before with uh, the the showrunner in Daredevil and then Loeb being across kind of the MCU as a whole. This is an adult version, but I don't think it's going to be that adult. Right. Or if it will be, it will be well done. Mm -hmm. Sorry, and just one final thing. It is just to say, this is the important thing, I think, about Marvel on Netflix Mm -hmm. is that we're able to discuss this. Yeah. Um, you know, in the same way as the uber violence from Daredevil and particularly the, the Wilson Fisk scene with, uh, the Russian, one of the Russian brothers' heads in the door. I can't remember the name of the, the brother now, but, you know, who would have thought maybe three years ago that in relation to a Marvel, um, property mm-hmm. that you could or it would generate those types of discussions that um, sort of, in a sense, broaden it out from purely comic yeah. uh, book stories. And again, you know, it has to be integral and part of the story. It can't just simply be something to add. Absolutely. Um, and I, I always think, and it always reminds me of what Brian Fuller said in relation to Hannibal on, on those types of things that, you know, he did stuff that was part of the story, mm-hmm. um, you know, and I think that's what they would do here, hopefully. Yeah. So, yeah, Absolutely. great, great uh, feedback and comment. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks very much for the feedback, Ben. And thanks again, Rebecca. Uh, if you want to send in your feedback, you can email us at feedback at defenders TV podcast.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at defenders cast. We will not be spoiling any episodes up there. So don't worry about it. And um, if you also want to contact us, you can contact us through Facebook by joining our group. Uh, just look for defenders tv podcast or you can join the page which is generally where we post our news and the episodes on defenders tv podcast and of course remember you can subscribe and listen to us at defenders tv podcast.com forward slash itunes or any other good podcast catcher just search defenders tv podcast and we will pop up into your feed and um, three baritone voices uh, discussing all things Jessica Jones. I want to be a s- soprano. Soprano! <laughs> you just need to get into a bar fight with, yeah. with, with, <laughs> with, with, with Jessica Jones. Jones. And with that, I'm off to buy an angle grinder. Mm. Abs of unbreakable steel. I'm off to do the 30-day shred. Unbreakable shred? <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. Our next episode will be out on Sunday, the 22nd of November. Thank you so much for listening. Bye. Bye.